for more reasons than one, pancreatic cancer is among the most difficult to treat and beat. However, our guest on this episode was diagnosed with the disease in 1994, and we're happy to say she is still going strong after four diagnoses. This is the Cancer Interviews Podcast, and I'm your host, Bruce Morton. Our guest is Kay Kays from Sun City, Arizona, and her strength comes not only from her survivorship, but her message of advocacy for others. So now it's time to hear her story. And Kay, welcome to Cancer Interviews. Thank you very much for having me, Bruce. We want to hear, first of all, about your life away from cancer, because we know you have a life away from cancer. So if you would tell us a bit about where you're from, what you do for work, and when time allows for fun, what you do for fun. Um, uh, I live in Arizona. Um, I'm sorry, you have to ask me that again, please. Okay. Uh, one more time, we'll ask just... Um, in terms of your life away from cancer, um, where are you from? What have you done and what do you do for work and what do you do for fun? Okay, gotcha. Uh, I'm originally from uh, Altoona, Pennsylvania, very small uh, mountain state, mountain town. Uh, I for love to bowl, uh, not a golfer, even though I live in Sun City, uh, I love to play Mahjong. And I love to be with my family and my grandchildren. And it's interesting that you don't play golf because I've heard in Sun City, the primary mode of transportation is golf carts. Hey, I live on a golf course. <laughs> I love to watch it. I, you know, I, I really do. Um, but uh, no, just never became interested in the game of golf. Well, let's talk about your life as it relates to your cancer journey. And for all of us who are cancer survivors, there was a time in which it seemed like things in terms of our health, things were normal and then they became abnormal. When did you first notice something wasn't quite right, Kay? You know, um, I wasn't feeling right, you know. For some reason, I was always in tune with my body. I was a um, avid hiker. I liked to play tennis. Um, uh, I seem, you know, love my work and everything, but, um, I started to lose weight. I thought my diet was working. I got upper chest pain. I thought, you know, I'm really stressed at work or I'm not really eating the right things. I was extremely tired and I thought I was just being uh, lazy. Um, but I took those into consideration and I went to see my PCP and I had some tests run. And Actually, I never heard from those tests. I figured no news was good news. But those tests were done in October. And in April, I had gone to a party. And I had done, there was alcohol there. And if you don't know, uh, alcohol can bring on pancreatic cancer. And I, uh, I ended up in emergency. They thought I had gallstones. Well, I didn't want to have gallstones. I heard they were pretty painful. So... Um, it did come out that uh, it was pancreatic cancer after four diligent uh, interns kept looking at it. And um, then uh, when I went back to my primary care, uh, my, my doctor had left and another one looked at my records and went, did anyone tell you you have a mass on your pancreas? And it's like, yeah, just now an emergency. So that's how it all began. Now, all of us are a bit different in terms of our diagnoses. We're all a bit different in terms of our persona. So the answer to this question varies from person to person. We already yes. know that this day, Kay, was an awful day when you learned you had cancer. But uh, taking all the variables at your end into consideration, how did you handle this news? I think I went into complete shock. Uh, I had never dealt with cancer. No one in my family had dealt with cancer. Um, and I just, um, I just did what, what everyone kind of told me, you know, you go see this doctor, this doctor. I had no really recollection what I was going through until I went in for the Whipple procedure and I was given my last rites. So following the Whipple procedure, it 
uh, you make it sound like, because um, I was going to ask you about treatment options, but it sounds like you didn't even have options for treatment. I had no treatment options. In fact, my, my very first oncologist said to me, if I were you, I would just get on an iceberg and push out. You know, that still brings kind of tears to my eyes because it was like, I was only 44 years old. I, you know, I, I wasn't really thinking about dying or having cancer. The only thing that I knew about cancer was the, you know, breast cancer. And I thought they were doing pretty good. And that there was no information out there. The only book I could find was at the American Cancer Society and said, you might live five years. And it's like, wow, you know, how, how do you work with that? Um, I do have to say, though, um, I'm still here. <laughs> and that's, fan that's fantastic. And we want to talk about the, the course that you have gone through since the year that you were talking about, 1994, and the present. By the way, we're confident you'll be able to learn some tips and tools to help you through your personal cancer journey. But first, we'd like to invite you to please give us a like, leave a comment, or a review below and share this story with your friends. Kindly click on the subscribe button below and click on the bell icon. That way you'll be notified the next time we release an interview. And if you or a loved one are facing a cancer diagnosis, please click on the link in the description and show notes below to check out our free guide, The Top 10 Things I Wish I Knew When I First Got Cancer. And it sounds like when you first got cancer, Okay, there, there was a lot of stuff that you didn't know, but I'm sure you had lots and lots of questions. But you were told you were told about being given last rites, and yet you're still here. So if you would, take us on the first steps of the journey from last rites to combating pancreatic cancer. Wow, that's quite a journey and a roller coaster ride. Um, well, let's start with the first step. Okay. Um, you know, I, the first thing that I had to learn that was very important was I grew up that you didn't ask doctor questions. You didn't, you didn't um, take up their time. You did what they said. You left. You never got second opinions. That was probably one of the most important things that I think I learned to, to move on. Um, because, like I said, there, there wasn't any information. Um, I continued through, I um, had to, you know, we, we do so much to heal our mind or our bodies, we have to heal our minds too. And it, it, I thought it was a pretty strong woman, but this brought me to my knees. And so I actually um, did a lot with the cancer support community that told me it was okay for me to ask questions. It was okay for me to get second opinions. And um, I continually moving forward in, in, in that path. So it sounds like you got a second opinion and that led to the early steps of treatment. And, and with treatment, at that time, did you have treatment options? No. The, the very first, I was diagnosed in 1994. And one of the, well, we, there was one chemo that they used, but it wasn't particularly for pancreatic, but the, the very first pancreatic uh, one didn't come out to like 2006, which was gemcitabine. So my options were, were kind of nil, especially I had what they called cis-mucinous adenocarcinoma. Um, this is a rare form of pancreatic cancer. So even if they would have had something, this would have been something that there was nothing tested. There were no clinical trials. There was nothing. So, um, so explain what, explain what uh, what treatment consisted of going forward. Um, surgeries. And the removal uh, of your pancreas, I suspect. Oh, I okay. I uh, yes, I w did qualify for what they call the Whipple procedure. The Whipple procedure is a reconstruction of the digestive system. Um, it, uh, it's quite intense, uh, and I was able to have that. Uh, only, what, I believe it's 15% of pancreatic cancer patients are eligible for that at that time. Um, so what did you have to go through when you went through the Whipple procedure? Wow. 
Um, it, it uh, I'm, you know, 30 years is a long time. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, um, I'm trying to, I, I, my feelings I can remember very well. I mean, it, it was really tough. Um, um, they do a, a, an incision across your chest, um, your, your stomach. Uh, I couldn't eat for two, uh, after the procedure, I had to carry a dish pan around with me for like two weeks because you can't eat. Um, but you know, I was very concerned about that, but I said to my surgeon about it, and he said, I guarantee by the end of the month, you'll be eating steak. So I carried a dish pan mainly because I kept, I like to eat and I kept trying to eat and it would just keep coming up. But it eventually went away. Um, I got a little stronger. Um, it was, it, it, you get very fatigued from it also. I can remember um, going to, uh, getting a shower and I had to lay down afterwards. It, uh, cancer, you know, it affects more than, you know, just the treatment. It affects your everyday life. And what were your sources of support at that very difficult time? At that time, um, my faith was very strong. There was no support, you know, um, you could go to, um, I did actually, after my whip, will go back to work. Um, and that was um, probably a year or so afterwards. Um, you'll have to excuse me. I lose my train of thought. <laughs> sure. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, you know, you're entering a new phase of your life, uh, a phase without a pancreas. What's that like? Oh, okay. The pancreas didn't come out till um five years later okay um so i went to five years that you know um hoping for the best but preparing for the worst you know because that's that's what had been told to me uh i was really excited about celebrating five years and doing a cat scan uh, it had come back to my pancreas so i did have um a pancreatectomy where they took out the pancreas and the spleen. Um, that was rather difficult to deal with, mainly because then I became a brittle diabetic. Um, and that means uh, I had to take insulin. So in the beginning, I would take five shots a day. Um, I wasn't very open to um, the pump uh, because I needed to have the control. Um, of doing it, but then it also, um, the pancreas does your digestive enzymes. So in order to eat, I had to learn to take digestive enzymes and, and uh, control it. Was there anything you couldn't eat at that at that stage? Did your diet change to the, yeah, the, the diet the stuff you couldn't eat? The diet changed very much, you know, grease, sugar, especially because of, you know, the diabetes, um, uh, you you learn to read your stomach even more. Uh, with me, tomatoes. Tomatoes were very harsh eating, and I love spaghetti, but, you know, every time I would eat it, you know, um, I would have to just eat it in moderation and with my digestive enzymes. But, you know, you, you just kind of, you go with the flow and, and you do what you can as far as eating. But, yeah, raw vegetables were tough. Anything that was hard to digest, you had to watch. Okay, so 1994 was your initial diagnosis. 1999 was your second diagnosis. And so I'm, I'm hoping that you were thinking at that stretch after uh, losing your pancreas and, and your spleen, having your diet altered, that uh, the worst of cancer was behind you. But there was a third diagnosis. When was that? That was three months after the um, pancreas was removed. Um, they ha I had a CAT scan um, because they keep close watch on you. Um, and that CAT scan showed something in the lymph node, an, an enlargement, a mass. Um, that was devastating. You know, I thought, you know, 
Wow, I was moving forward, you know, I was adapting. And that was like taking three steps forward and four back. Um, it, it, was, it, it was a very depressing time um, that you had to get through to even think about treatment. But the thing that was, um, I did go for different opinions because I was hearing you're inoperable for the lymph node. No one had done a lot of it. And I went to a lot of um, institutions here in uh, Arizona. Um, but I wasn't ready to give up. You know, I, I, uh, uh, I had gotten already two diagnoses, but I had talked to oncologists. And I found out that what I needed to do was talk to a surgeon. And one of my oncologists did send me to a specific pancreatic cancer uh, surgeon uh, who was a specialist. And uh, I, I was so surprised when I had, he looked at my work and he said, I think there's something we can do for you. And so then I started to go through treatment. But during that process, it took me a year to get someone to say, I think there's something we can do for you. Um, that was tough because my CA-19, which is a, the only pancreatic cancer marker we have, unreliable, but we have to use that, kept going up by the thousands each month. So it was pretty high. Um, but uh, I was able to come home. Actually, he served as a support system um, for my uh, surgeon here, and I was able to come here, took chemo then for the very first time, and um, had it removed. So another challenge. Yes, well, chemo all by itself is a challenge. If you could look back, Kay, what was the most difficult part? Because with chemo, we hear about hair loss, we hear that food tastes terrible, we hear that there's a lot of fatigue. In your experience with chemo, what was the toughest part? I think the toughest part was the hair loss <laughs> because I had already gone through, you know, the eating and everything. Um, it, it was, it was, uh, wow, it, it was a hard, a hard thing to do. Um, um, redefining normal in your life, you know, uh, is not easy and to keep redefining it. But, you know, um, I, I still tried to, to do as, as normal as I could, but, you know, like I said, you, um, I was very uh, active at the cancer support community who had a lot of these um, uh, programs that helped me through the hair loss, the depression, uh, and uh, kept me going. And do you recall what kind of medication you took for, for this chemo journey? Because uh, it's not like there's a one-size-fits-all medication for chemo. It, uh, it varies from, from diagnoses to diagnoses. Do you remember what kind of medication you took? At that time, I believe it was only Zofran, you know, that they were, they were giving me. Um, because it was just gemcitabine at that time because... Uh, uh, as as research continued, you know, now there there's a combination, but it was just gemcitabine, and probably one of the biggest um, uh, side effects of it was the you know the hair loss and the fatigue. Were there any cognitive issues for you? Um, mentally, yes. <laughs> um, you know, but. Um, when there's love, you work around it, you know? Um, so that, that was it. Okay, so now you've gone through, you've gone through three diagnoses, but um, again, one would like to think that cancer was in your rearview mirror, but there was a fourth one. When was that and how did it manifest itself? Um, that one was in 2008, I believe. Uh, and that was uh, a spot on my lung. Now, pancreatic cancer generally goes to the lung, liver, and lymph nodes. So uh, I did have a biopsy done, but I really had to push for that because they didn't want to go in because it was so small. 
But I had started to get um, intrigued in research. And I remember a researcher saying, one centimeter can be a death sentence to a pancreatic patient. And so when I went in, I was a little insistent that I wanted a biopsy done on this because otherwise it was, let's just watch and see. I'd already been through too much with this cancer and I did, did not want to watch and see. So I laid on the table actually for an hour um, trying to get this biopsy and finally said to the radiologist, um, I think I have more faith in you than you do. <laughs> and he finally said, okay, he did it. And it came back and they said, it's pancreatic cancer. And you know your body probably better than we do. And those were the exact words. So anyway, then there was the decision, you know, there wasn't much chemo again. Um, but I did have the option of a surgery because of where it was. So I elected the surgery and went for the removal of my lower right lung lobe, which was another devastating surgery. <laughs> well, you're talking lungs. Uh, once this procedure was done, how did it affect your breathing? Uh, you know, at first it was, uh, I noticed it, but I have to say as time went on, my lung has actually expanded. Mm. My lung is probably pretty normal size. The problem I have is they had cracked a rib in that and where they took the piece off, it gets stuck <laughs> in my rib cage sometimes. And it reminds me that I'm here, you know, and what we did. But uh, I, I really, um, as far as uh, elevations and everything, I, I still, I can fly. I can still go up north hiking. Uh, I still have redefined my life to what I can do. And how exciting is that, knowing that you've been hit with this <clears throat> in slightly different versions four times, and yet you're still with us? How exciting is that? <laughs> It is really surreal. You know, it's really hard to sit here and talk because all the, you know, sometimes I forget some of the words in that, but all the emotions are still there. And it's, it's surreal. I, I, I can't believe it, but I always just put one foot in front of the other, you know, crossed each bridge as I came to it and, you know, kept focusing on different things also other than just the cancer. Um, which helped me through. Hey, I have to ask, you are, you are still involved in, in the fight against cancer, helping others. <laughs> Excuse me, we're going to get to that in a second. But we're recording this in the year 2024. You were initially diagnosed in 1994. If you had had the same diagnosis today, how would your treatment differ than what you went through in 1994? <laughs> Gives me chills just when you ask that because um, during my journey, I have become a patient research advocate. And so I have been able to see all the, all the advances, all the, we have now have seven chemos that are working well. The expertise that are in our doctors now, we have pancreatic cancer specialists. We have clinical trials, you know, um, I, I have to remind patients when I talk to them, you know, when they go, I can't, you know, find something of that. It's like, you know, I wear a smile on my face because I see what has changed and it has changed for the better. I mean, and it's going to get even better because we have some of the best, um, researchers, uh, that are caring and committed out there working on this disease. Excellent. Kate, we're going to wrap up now, but I want to hear you elaborate on a, on a word that you think is very important for anybody on a cancer journey, whether it's pancreatic cancer or any other type of cancer. And I, I want to hear about how this word should apply. It has applied to your journey, but I want to hear how that word should apply to the journey of others. Very simply, that word is hope. Hope. For sure. That is the magic word. You know, uh, hope, you know, it, it, it gets you through it. You know, if there's no hope, you have no fight. And without the fight, 
you're not, you, you've got a harder battle than you need to have. So, I, you know, my, it would be hope. And, you know, the other thing would be research, you know, believe in your research. Um, it's not, it, it's not, how do I want to say, I'm a patient research advocate. I watch what they're doing. The, the research is just fantastic. They're so innovative. Do not be afraid, uh, especially in pancreatic, because from the time that a researcher finds something till it gets to the patient, takes 13 to 17 years. When you do the math, some of our best chemos are still in clinical trial, and that's the same for a lot of other cancers. Well, that's exciting news for, for people who uh, have just been diagnosed, and, uh, and there are those, unfortunately, who don't even know that they're going to be diagnosed, but they, but they will be one day, that, uh, that there's hope and there's research on their side. Hey, Kays, it's good to tally up a score of K4 and cancer nothing. You've been diagnosed four times, and you're still with us, and you're still going strong, and we're so glad that we got to hear your story. Kay, thanks so much for being with us on Cancer Interviews. Thank you for allowing me to share. And that's going to wrap up this edition of Cancer Interviews. We want to remind you that if you or a loved one are on a cancer journey, you are not alone. There are people out there like Kay and the researchers that she has just alluded to that are there that can make your cancer journey a bit easier. So until next time, we'll see you on down the road.